How should outsiders think uh, about developments uh, within these African states, this, this new African entrepreneurship, or rather this old African entrepreneurship mm -hmm. that's finding uh, you know, uh, new avenues? I think this is one of the most challenging aspects of talking about this topic um, with audiences that are not in Africa. I think, but it is very subversive and surprising to many people who are like, oh, but I thought I was supposed to send my t-shirts. Like, isn't that better than nothing? And the answer is no, it is not better than nothing, right? Um, that if you send a t-shirt, you might put a tailor out of work. You might suppress a textile economy. And, in, and we have seen that sort of textile manufacturing has shrunk in proportion to the sort of flood of imports. T-shirts never this hurt anybody. Yeah, right. I mean, you know, the Denver Broncos t-shirts that are probably making their way to Africa right now, you know, won't do any good or or at least will 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 not solve the underlying problem which is not being able to afford clothes, let's say, which requires income, which requires a job, which requires, you know, financing for small businesses. Like there's a cascading hierarchy of needs, least of which is a t-shirt. <laughs>um, you know, my perspective is one of a reporter, um, someone who was concerned with the narrative I saw, um, in which there was this kind of homogenous posture toward Africa as a place uh, where it's sort of there lie dragons, right? Where it's destitute, where there's poverty, um, where there's disease, where there's conflict. Um, and so the broad brush had already been painted on some level. And so what I chose to do with my reporting was to try and uh, sort of dig beneath that and to go to the ground. Uh, a lot of the work I saw about Africa in the popular press was focused on the West on some level, about institutions in America or in Europe and what they could be doing differently. Um, again, as a reporter, I sort of wanted to go and talk to ordinary people. Um, I didn't, as I said, get to nearly all of them, but um, on some level, the project of deconstructing Africa required not necessarily resorting to these national boundaries, to the 54 countries that uh, comprise the continent, but to sort of concepts that united black Africa. Um, and those, you know, I try and sketch out in my book as a way of reframing not just our sense of the geography of Africa, but also the narrative that I thought was in uh, was so was so damaging, I think, for the continent's growth and progress. So there's a literal map of Africa that we're familiar with that has been distorted in various ways uh, over the course of recorded history, but there are also other maps that you identify. Tell us a bit about them. Yeah, well, I mean, the book starts from the premise that, you know, the, the maps of Africa are sort of inherently inaccurate or inauthentic. Um, if you look at the modern political map of Africa, um, it will cleave regions that would have spoken the same language, that would have shared a political community in the past. Um, and so the somewhat arbitrary nature of the borders, um, first enshrined in the sort of 1884 Berlin Conference, and then in 1963 when the first wave of the Organization for African Unity, the predecessor to the African Union, decided that they were gonna fix those borders um, in stone. And, and it turns out that you know most of the most interesting economic activity, um, the most interesting commercial and sort of social relationships don't follow those borders. So I tried to identify five things that, five maps that matter more to Africa than its political map. And those were family, technology, commerce, nature, and youth. Um, and so with this sort of new compass, I sort of set out orienting myself around the continent to try and explain how these institutions matter more than state-based institutions and that non-state actors um, from very small NGOs, ordinary people, to large multinational corporations, all deploy these maps in ways that uh, more closely meet uh, the people in Africa where they are. So what you're telling us is that if we were to focus on the political map, on the map of states uh, into which the continent is divided, we're going to actually lose a lot of the texture uh, of lived experience. Yes, that's right. I mean, I think, uh, I know rather, that the region from Lagos, Nigeria, which is the city I've spent most time in as a Nigerian, um, all the way uh, west to uh, Abidjan and Ivory Coast, that area functions as a kind of superhighway of trade. Um, you've got five ports all along the coast. You've got goods arriving from uh, foreign countries and goods leaving each of these countries. And you've got people 
going back and forth between them. You know, my parents, who grew up in Nigeria, uh, went to Accra to take their medical school exams, for example, their medical boards. Um, and so the region, as a sort of, you know, pan-West African commercial zone, makes a lot more sense as a way of thinking about the, uh, the lives of people and the, th and, their, and the progress that's possible than to think about Ghana, Togo, Benin, Nigeria. Yet when we think about many of the political conflicts uh, of the last three decades, they seem to have involved conflicts over migration flows as well. So, you know, perhaps these migration flows that have traditionally been a part of West African life are now abutting, uh, they're kind of mixing with new state structures in ways that are engendering tension. Is that, uh, is that one way of thinking I'm about not, it? I mean, that, that's, that's an interesting premise. Um, I think that you know, for example, the Fulani ethnic group is present in all 17 West African states, right? It's a nomadic group that has, has for centuries, sort of uh, persisted uh, as a presence across different borders. Um, my focus really is, I would say in this respect, economic. I think that there's real strength in numbers when it comes to thinking about Africa present and future. I think um, the smaller countries of Africa, uh, the Guineas, the Togos, the Benins, just to limit the study to West Africa, um, benefit most when the entire region, the ECOWAS, um, which is where my passport is from, um, the ECOWAS region looks a lot more like the EU or the Schengen zone, where you have free trade within um, these entities, you have people who can cross borders freely. And yes, there may be sort of mm, minor actual conflicts over land, but I find them to be minor in comparison to the sort of upside of having these huge economic zones where you don't just have 10 million people or 25 million people in Ghana, but you have, you know, we're talking about 300 million people in West Africa, 400 million in the East African community, 450 million in the South African community. And those start to look like sort of economic competitors for those big economies that everyone consists consistently talks about India, China, Brazil, Russia. So what are the barriers to this kind of integration? Given that you already have these uh, family networks, uh, these ethnic networks that uh, you know, uh, cross various borders, mm -hmm. uh, what are the institutional barriers to that mm -hmm. deeper integration? I think it's a lot of bad habits. I think there's this fear that um, continuing to partition Africa into further states um, would have been dangerous. This was the thought in 1963 and why the borders were preserved by African heads of state at the time. Um, but if you look at, I'll take two examples, um, South Sudan, which seceded from North Sudan um, just in the last two years, um, that has been, that was the result of 25 years of a grinding conflict in which you know, many hundreds of thousands of people died. And so it should not be at the cost of all these lives that you finally get the opportunity to have your own political community. The other example I point to is Somaliland, you know, which is an offshoot country, uh, unrecognized by any global community, um, that is trying to separate itself from Somalia itself. Um, and Somalia is interesting because, you know, it's ethnically homogenous, linguistically homogenous, religiously homogenous, and yet, you know, it's spent... So by traditional part. standards, it's kind of the right. ideal African state. So many people right. complain about the right. fact that you've got multi-confessional, multi-linguistic states that don't resemble the kind of traditional nation states uh, right. of Europe. Somalia seems to be a total counterexample, yet... And yet, you know, there are five different parts of Somalia, and in part because colonialism hit parts of Somalia differently. The British were there, the Italians were there, the French were there, and that's now Djibouti. Um, you have a, a fierce kind of nationalism that I found rare in my reporting across the continent. People who had agreed to share a political community, who were willing to fight to preserve that political community, um, even in the face of less um, international recognition. They've created their own security apparatus, they've printed their own currency, they've got their own parliament, and it's by all accounts, you know, a positive story in Africa because it has this legitimacy that many other countries in Africa lack. Um, and so to move beyond... The story of Somalia or the story of Somaliland The story of Somaliland mm -hmm. specifically is an example of, you know, a country thriving, a political community that is thriving despite the sort of chaos um, and dysfunction that we all associate with Somalia, which surrounds it. And I think it's a nice microcosm for the problem um, the narrative problem for many African countries. You know, Somalia, the first thing anyone thinks of is Black Hawk Down, they think of, you know, chaos. They think of the true fact that since 1991, it has not had a functional government. And yet, you know, the people who are, that narrative of Somalia is holding hostage the, the 1.2 million people, you know, who are in Somaliland um, and who are fighting to sort of create 
a stable existence for themselves um, and, a, and a presence in, in global markets. Somaliland to me is one of the great Rorschach tests of the modern world. Mm. Uh, you know, I certainly encounter some Somalis who are very resentful and disappointed about the fact that Somaliland behaves like a sovereign state. Uh, yet there are others who observe that Somaliland really has achieved a lot of legitimacy. Mm -hmm. It is seen as a broadly inclusive and representative government. Yet, because it is not an unrecognized government, it also receives no overseas development assistance. Mm -hmm. And there are at least some people who suggest that the fact that Somaliland is not on the political map of the world in that fashion, mm -hmm. because it doesn't have the recognition that makes it uh, open to receiving this kind of assistance, mm -hmm. that that could be why the government functions as well as it does. I'm not sure if it, it's... I mean, I think you're broadly correct, and I think Nicholas Eubank at Stanford has produced the, the study that sort of looks at uh, the ability to provide for its citizens as being um, more pronounced than comparable countries that don't receive, that receive assistance. And I think broadly, when you talk about foreign assistance, it does tend to decrease government spending, right, by a, a co-equal amount. For every dollar donated, government's cut back by 30 cents. Um, and so in that sense, it's been positive for Somaliland, who has had to fend for itself without the crutch of foreign assistance. And they assistance. have to raise revenue from right, the, their own economy. Base. That's yeah. right. And I think in many countries, the real question for many Africans is, you know, when thinking about government is, what have you done for me lately? And the answer is very often, very little. And so you have this sort of chicken and egg problem where people are unwilling to fund a government that is predatory, that is not custodial. Um, and as a result, the government's um, functions decline and then foreign assistance becomes um, seen as an easy alternative to that in terms of budget support. Um, and you have this sort of declining vicious cycle, I guess I'll say, um, of, of lack of faith and lack of performance. Um, that is, I think really brings us to this idea that you know, what many people perceive is lack of competence on the part of African governments, which I think is very true. Now, you did most of your reporting while based in Nairobi. Correct. And tell me a bit about Nairobi and Kenya more broadly, because it certainly looks to outsiders as though you have emerging in East Africa a really interesting case of a variety of different countries that are moving in this more entrepreneurial kind of direction where mm -hmm. you've seen an increase in growth rates. Uh, what people in the West, what people in the outside world would see as positive development? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know that this is a new trend. I think it's a very old one that's getting new recognition because it has new tools to amplify it. And the tools I mean are technology tools. I moved to Kenya, I first visited Kenya sort of chasing the story of African technology. Um, in 2009, this was something that really captivated my imagination. Um, fiber optic cables connected East Africa for the first time. And I remember, you know, having spent a lot of time in Nigeria, you know, in the, uh, the late 90s and early aughts, uh, the internet wasn't super fast, but it wasn't incredibly slow. But 2009, I mean, that is to say five years ago, uh, East Africa did not have super fast internet. And so this sea creature kind of like latched onto the East Coast and suddenly, you know, the magic of the internet was, was available to many people. And so Google set up an office there. You have Safaricom, a very innovative telecom company that is providing mobile banking services for the large, uh, the, the lion's share of the population now. And so the technology story was something that really defined Kenya and has continued to define Kenya as a leader um, across the continent for innovative technology. You have mobile payment services that are in many respects more advanced than what you find in more affluent countries. Correct. And I think, again, the big theme of the book is that, you know, Africa does more with less because it has to, that necessity drives innovation, and that Africa is the mother of necessity in some level. And so people are able to refuse to use objects as marketed to them, to, to recycle and renew um, ordinary objects like a mobile phone to be um, a flashlight, to be an ATM, to be um, a lifeline for uh, market information about agricultural pricing or health information. And so by lack of the lack of sort of external products, the ones we might have in the US to do all these things for us, has required more generative uses of technology. And technology is itself generative, right? I mean, to return to the earlier conversation we were having, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurialism, is nothing new, not in Africa, not anywhere. Um, but it's been obscured, I think, by um, the sort of rudimentary tools that people were able to deploy. Um, Suddenly, technology is an amplifier of these existing workarounds, of this existing system of hustling and, and hacking. And, um, you know, I use the example of the guy who built my bed in Kenya. Um, his name's Emmanuel. You know, he's uh, in his mid-20s. And he struggles 
to find clients who want to, you know, he does carpentry skills, but sometimes the power is out and he can't always use a bandsaw, and sometimes he doesn't know if he's going to have a truck to make these deliveries. Um, his life is made a lot easier by access to finance in the form of M-Pesa, for example. Um, but he's always been there, right? It's just now we can see him. And I think that's been a huge part of what drives my reporting is to sort of spotlight people who are doing, uh, doing a lot with very little. So you've had people with tremendous energy and drive, and yet it was very difficult for them to, for example, accumulate assets, mm -hmm. or very difficult for them to borrow if they can't demonstrate that they have assets mm -hmm. because those assets are effectively invisible. Mm -hmm. So tell me about um, this technological boom what were its sources? I mean, so, you know, is this a product of uh, indigenous engineering talent that just, you know, uh, was capitalizing on the new availability of, uh, mm -hmm. of the internet? Or, or, or was it, uh, you know, members of the diaspora returning home? Where mm -hmm. did it come from? Mm -hmm. I think this was technology that, I'll use these, I'll use a couple of examples from Kenya. One is uh, Ushahidi, which many people may know by now. It means witness in Swahili. And it began as a sort of citizen reporting mechanism. Um, this was technology that the Red Cross had developed but had never really used. During the 2007-2008 election crisis in Kenya, you had people um, fighting in the streets, you had um, a news media that had gone silent, you had open violence, you had a contested election, likely stolen, um, and people were not sure what to do. And so three or four bloggers came together, united by the internet, a new tool that allowed them to, con to find one another, um, started building this software. Um, they layered on this existing Red Cross interface that was open source, uh, that had been literally sitting around for years, that had, no one, had, had found no real use, um, and de developed something that allowed people with mobile phones to sort of put themselves on this map, to say, I'm here, this is what's going on, this is what I saw. And if six other people also saw the same thing, you know, you can verify that some event happened. And so it really sped the effort to sort of make sense of what was going on in Kenya at the time. And it's since been used in a multitude of other contexts, um, whether it's election monitoring in Nigeria or in Gaza or in Sudan or elections in South America. Um, it monitored uh, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. So it allowed citizens to sort of articulate their presence on a map, which is a very elegant, very simple tool which already existed. Likewise, mobile phone technology um, allowed consumers to send mobile phone airtime back and forth um, well before mobile banking had become this sort of viral phenomenon it's been in Africa. And so people would use it as a kind of digital currency. They'd be like, okay, you gave me a ride, here's 10 minutes of talk time. Um, all right, well, I'll give you five minutes of talk time for this you know, pack of cigarettes, whatever it was. It was yeah. very informal, but the minutes, people realized they could be used for something, right? Um, in a way that we might never have occurred to us here in America. Um, and so that, you know, it's USSD technology. It already existed, but it was the fact that people needed it to work differently, that they were able to drive um, a solution that came from it. One more example I'll share with you is from Malawi and is about healthcare. Um, and I love this story because it's, uh, I sort of grew up hearing this adage, which is very Yoruba, one man's meat is another man's poison, which I guess the idea being that, you know, something that's of no use to someone could be really important to another. And in this case, it was the case that in the, the aftermath of the sort of dot-com bust, um, these sort of really rudimentary touchscreen computers had gone on sale on eBay um, for about $20 a piece. Um, and a Canadian guy, and this is an example of a sort of savvy person who was working in public health, who had a long understanding of what was going on in Malawi, bought a bunch of these, brought them to Malawi, um, hired local software engineers, and I think there's a lot of engineering talent in Africa um, at some of these very well-trained universities or university settings, um, and they started to do to make sure to hack it. They were like, we're going to make sure it uses very little energy, we're going to make sure it can survive the dust here, we're going to make a touchscreen element to it, and so they've installed these kind of castaway devices um, in, in 11 hospitals in Malawi. You know, I think all three of these examples demonstrate technology amplifying an existing need, um, and in each case, sort of providing a useful development good. Um, and in the case of Malawi, you know, it was integrated into the government later. The government might never have incubated some technology solution for its hospitals. Very often, these bureaucracies are just not creative enough or incentivized enough to do this. And so that's maybe the best case scenario, where some innovator has used technology in an innovative way and then someone recognizes it and allows it to scale using the convening power of government. But that's very rare. So 
Across Africa, you have these tremendously enterprising people, hard-charging, ambitious, etc. Yet, presumably, there are some societies that are providing a better platform for those people than others. So which were the ones, in the course of your reporting, did you find uh, to be kind of more promising landscapes for this entrepreneurial drive? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think Kenya certainly has been, uh, has this is what we call an enabling environment, which I hate to say because it's such a development buzzword. <laughs> And it's always the role of government is to provide an enabling environment for people to pursue their dreams. Um, or even it, not to just mess with people. Yeah, right. Just to sort of stay out of the way or make sure the roads are smooth. I mean, that, that can be an enabling environment, and we should talk more about that. Um, I think when I compare, um, ugh, it's hard to generalize, and I don't want to. Um, when I was in Cameroon, for example, I think there's a really f sort of nascent but important tech scene going on there. Um, it has, um, as a francophone country, sort of less natural ties um, to the sort of Silicon Valley sort of boom. It doesn't have as many Americans or Europeans, um, people from the UK sort of spending time there. Um, and so it can be difficult. Um, one thing I did notice, in Cameron in particular, was the, uh, the woman I spoke to there talked about the guy who sets tech policy using like Yahoo to email and like not really understanding the internet. And this is the guy who runs the postal service. And so they've just kind of been like, oh, snail mail, email. We'll just give him that portfolio, you know? And so there's a kind of like stupidity about the task at hand that can, can retard this enabling environment we're talking about. Um, but for the most part, you know, I think all countries have this deficiency where there is innovation happening faster than the pace of change in government. I might include the United States in that category. So, um, you know, the enabling environment in some cases, in many cases, is things like access to finance. If you think about a bootstrapping entrepreneur who's got a great idea and they live in Palo Alto, um, they could they have a couple of options, right? This like big pile of capital that's swishing around Silicon Valley looking to place money in sort of, you know, some app or what have you. Maybe it's a great idea, maybe it's not. They have, um, in addition to that, a credit card that they could max out, right? There's very few credit cards, there's very few access, to, there's very little access to credit all across Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and maybe they'll ask like, you know, friends and fools first, right? The angel class of investors. Um, if you're in Cameroon and you have an idea, almost everyone you know is very likely to be very poor. And so you don't have this kind of bootstrapping economy, or at least you know, people you could even think of that might help you support your idea. So this drives what I call sort of lean innovation, where you don't really have a lot of opportunities to uh, be capital and labor intensive. Um, or rather, you can be labor intensive without being capital intensive. And that tends to sort of drive all decision making, um, the situation of constraint. So the thing to, the bottleneck to solve, to, innate, to create this enabling environment is almost everywhere access to finance that allows people not to just rely on the government, but to, to, to think about making their own way. Yet there's a danger because those strictures can actually be constructive to some degree as well. So kind of while introducing mm -hmm. abundance can make certain things easier and create more opportunities, mm -hmm. it might also change that environment in ways that uh, lead you to fat thinking, I guess. As yeah, no, I, I think that's quite right. Um, I don't see any, I don't see that as there's a big no risk. There's no danger. Well, it's not a, it's not a current <laughs> risk. <laughs> well, there's something, so implicit in, in your observation about Cameroon um, is this idea that societies that are part of this francophone network are not part of the Anglophone network mm -hmm. and that there might be some value to being embedded in this larger English-speaking community. Which mm -hmm. brings me to the diaspora. We talked mm -hmm. about it briefly before, mm -hmm. but tell me a bit about the fact that you've had this enormous number of high human capital, highly educated mm -hmm. people emigrating from Africa. I think that, you know, traditionally that was thought of as a brain drain. Mm -hmm. Traditionally that was thought of as something, you know, kind of really tragic to have uh, people trained, let's say, in West Africa working for the National Health Service in Britain or whatever else. Mm -hmm. Yet it seems that it's actually not a one-way street. Right. I mean, you know, I think the, the brain gain, which is the flip side of that, is folks who are the children of the people who left Africa in the 60s and 70s. People like myself deciding to spend time in Africa, to invest in Africa, to contribute their human resources to Africa. Um, and that is and certainly an ongoing trend. Um, but in the meantime, I think what's been overlooked is the flow of remittances to Africa, which I think in 2007 first surpassed the amount of foreign assistance um, and foreign investment in Africa. So that has been, you know, a $20 billion a year flow just to sub-Saharan Africa of people like my parents um, and other folks who have 
who are, who are first generation migrants elsewhere who are sending money home to support people. Um, and I think that has been this extremely underreported source of finance. Um, and it's the real social safety net, right? I mean, we talk about the family map. That's what we're talking about, um, which is this sort of, uh, it's, it's, an, it's a combination of obligation and sort of understanding and familiarity. I think for a lot of investors, it seems like, oh, you know, I don't really know this environment. Like, I don't know the guy who knows the guy. Let me stay away. But for someone who has done well in the U.S. or done well in the U.K. or something or has done well elsewhere in Europe, um, to return home savvy to the opportunities and the sort of operating environment um, is a real plus. Um, and I think, you know, I'll think about one specific example in Nigeria. Jumia is a company that I profile briefly in the book. It is Amazon, right? It's Amazon, it's an e-commerce play, it's in Nigeria and expanding to other countries in West Africa. Um, but wait, mm, there's no postal service in Nigeria. So how are you gonna figure out how to do <laughs> a delivery-based e-commerce play? Well, this guy went with motorbikes, right? Um, motorcycles were a common way for me to get around, whether I was in Nigeria, whether I was in Kenya, Uganda, South Africa, you hop on the back of a motorbike, no problem. Um, in Nigeria, in Lagos in particular, this is a funny sort of historical political issue, um, these guys known as Okadas were kind of banned from central areas. <laughs> and so there was a, all of a sudden a lot of free motorcycles um, sort of roaming around the major city. And so this guy was like, we're gonna have cash on delivery. We'll bring you everything on the back of a motorcycle, which is, again, Understanding, bringing the, the knowledge of Amazon and its incredible ability to solve problems and provide goods for people from the U.S. and applying that to and adapting it for the Nigerian environment is exactly what we mean when we say there's a diaspora dividend. Um, and so it's this incredibly successful thing. It allows people to buy things that they need in, in, in a, what was otherwise a very constrained environment for making, for, for retail sector. And part of what you're suggesting is that this knowledge transfer is two-way in the sense that you have uh, people are settling in uh, these non-African societies, bringing back business models, but then actually innovating on those business models and bringing insights potentially right. back to the fat countries. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the sort of optimal flow of information. Um, I think these, we talk about leapfrogging, right, where you've had to, you don't have to do the landline thing. I mean, I never used a landline, like, well, just literally to, never. Just to clarify, so, you know, when we talk about leapfrogging, traditionally when we think about development, we think about societies going through a very clear path. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, when you look at East Asia, you begin by, you know, engaging in garment manufacturing, then you start manufacturing electronics, mm -hmm. then you start designing electronics, mm -hmm. then you're a rich country. Whereas what you're saying is that it's possible for Africa, uh, for, you know, many societies within Africa and, and other developing world regions, we'll get back mm -hmm. to that, uh, that they don't have to go through each step. Oh, of course. I mean, why would you, right? I mean, you already have the sort of accumulated wisdom and knowledge. I'll give two examples that are manufacturing based because I think manufacturing in Africa, I mean, there's been this sort of call center boom, which I think is relevant and interesting given the preponderance of English speakers, native um, English speakers all across the continent. But manufacturing is really important. So one comes from, again, Nigeria, the other comes from Uganda. Um, and both are differently important for development, right? And again, I, I don't like the idea of development as linear, where you start you know, with nothing and you end up in Las Vegas. I think that's silly. But so the one play is just a very simple cut and paste aluminum can factory. Um, you know, it's a private equity play. Um, most of the cans in Sub-Saharan Africa, believe it or not, are made of steel and come from South Africa, where there's a steel plant, and that's it. So there's no aluminum cans for, think about all the things you might need it for, right? So these guys were like, well, we'll just do that. Great. So they set this up. Um, they employ, you know, a couple hundred people, and they're printing money as well as making cans. Um, the other play in manufacturing is in Uganda and is for pharmaceuticals, right? I mean, why? I mean, so there's there's still this high disease burden all across the continent. In Uganda, I think um, the growth rate for HIV/AIDS infections is five percent a year. Um, and so there's still an urgent public health need. The government does a lot of procurement through the Global Fund, through its own Ministry of Health's budget, um, to buy drugs that the people need. But they're buying them from India, and they're buying them from elsewhere, mm -hmm. where they're made cheaply and sent over. So this guy said, um, this consortium of investors said, okay, well, why can't we do that here? We have a, you know, a World Health Organization certified plant. We'll get local employment. We'll keep more of the value in the country, and we'll make the anti antiretrovirals. We'll make the antimalarials, and we'll sell them to people. Um, and so that 
again, responds to the unusual local meat demand for these kinds of health products, but also proves that you can make a product in Africa that's just as good as one you might make in India. Um, and I think those are the kinds of ventures that I think you know, we need to see more of. You mentioned India, and my understanding is that when you're looking at some of the debates around development in India, there is actually a lot of talk about manufacturing and the fact that India hasn't seen nearly as much manufacturing as, for example, China. Mm -hmm. And the anxiety there is that the reason why you had call centers and also the offshoring of uh, sophisticated services like financial services, software development, et cetera, is because India's infrastructure is incredibly poor. Mm -hmm. And so the way that you know, Indian firms have been uh, you know, able to capitalize is by having high human capital Indians do this kind of work, yet because it's not labor intensive manufacturing, it's not something that's helping the real bulk of the population. Mm, right. uh, would you say that there's a similar dynamic uh, in some of these um, African societies where you have some high human capital people who can do that kind of um, you know, software work, financial services work, et cetera, but because you don't have the infrastructure and you don't have some of the legal institutions in place, mm -hmm. that it's harder to actually have that mass effect Yes, I agree with you. I think that if you want to, again, to back up a little, um, my understanding of the literature is that very poor people articulate their wants and needs, not so much in terms of actual money, but in terms of stability and the ability to plan, which is to say stable income. It can come from the informal sector, which is 70% of employment in the continent, or the formal sector, um, which is you know something that's growing but not nearly enough to support this, well, this workforce. Um, and jobs in the formal sector are often constrained by access to finance in the same ways we've talked about, where people can't hire new workers. And so a lot of... Very tightly regulated as well. Right. So the other, I think, really transformational advantage that Africa has is in agriculture, right? Which is two out of every three people in, in sub-Saharan Africa are touched by agri the agricultural sector. Um, huge land dividend, huge land holdings. Um, the ability to make land productive, which is labor intensive, which does help a lot of people employ themselves, must be a, a sort of feature of any reasonable discussion about Africa's future. Not least because we have these global food needs that are rising um, and a lot of waste you know, in fat economies as I talk about. Um, but this a tremendous productive capacity in Africa to uh, plant crops that everyone needs. Um, and these there are sort of political considerations, there are sort of ugly, um, protectionist policies in countries like the United States that keep that exclude African agriculture from American markets, but you know it's the kind of thing that, while very that will always be very labor intensive, right? Um, obviously, there's different models for farming. I mean, you see, you go to Iowa and you see, you know, one farmer on a tractor covering acres and acres of land, whereas in Africa it's these tiny one-acre plots where one person's still doing a lot of the work. Um, but in the short term, I think to employ lots of people, to make sure they have this ability to plan, this ability for st stable income, I think emphasizing not just manufacturing but agricultural sector is something that surprised me when I you know, reported across Africa, but, but is super important. And you also talk about some of the potential environmental benefits as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, tell us a bit about that. I mean, you know, uh, is there, uh, tell us about some of the environmental innovation that's been happening in Africa as well. Well, again, this is all driven by necessity. This is the spirit of Kanju, which is a Yoruba word I've coined to talk about the specific creativity born of African difficulty, right? When, <laughs> when electricity doesn't reach the last mile and when it may never, um, when power goes out every single day in an urban area, um, when your substitutes are things like kerosene, which is very dangerous, or uh, firewood and charcoal, which are very hazardous for your lungs. The pain point, to use a sort of business school term, um, is really acute. You need to find an alternative energy source. And so this is why I think you know, the, the ceiling um, on alternative energy uptake in a commercial way is nowhere higher than in Africa, um, where, again, maybe eventually you know, uh, a government in another country might be able to guarantee the infrastructure that would provide electricity. Um, but in a place like you know, rural Tanzania, um, you know, central Burkina Faso, um, even in sort of you know, urban Nigeria, that might never happen, um, or it might not happen for, for far too long for people's own satisfaction. And so you're seeing sort of sales forces that vend solar lanterns. You're seeing mobile phone charging stations that are again are solar powered. 
a lot of cell phone towers across the continent. You know, the one thing that people will not live without um, are powered by alternative energy because the companies know that um, you know, if the cell phone towers go out, then like you know, then nothing's going to happen. It's already this sort of breathtaking drain on productivity across the continent. Um, but again, I think it's been generative, just the way these other difficulties have been generative. So alternative energy is actually not a luxury. It's not a want to have. It's a must have yeah. because of the unreliability of the grid and, and other yeah. basic infrastructure. No, that's well said. That's well said. It's true. So I wonder also about, uh, you mentioned the demographic dividend. Now, uh, when you look at China, a society that many people in the United States certainly think of as, a, as an emerging power, this is a country that's actually aging more rapidly than the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Japan, another affluent country that's aging very rapidly. Mm -hmm. You certainly see this across Europe as well. Whereas Africa has an extraordinarily youthful population. Tell us a bit about that. I mean, it's the numbers are... Uh, sort of boggle the mind, right? It's 70% of the population is under 30. And the growth is not slowing. And so in a place like you mentioned, these countries in Asia and in Italy. Birth rates are declining somewhat. Birth rates are declining, but uh, the replacement rate, which is a, a metric that's mm -hmm. used, you know, for every two people in Italy, it's like 1.3 people. Yeah. Um, so the population is declining in that way. And in Japan, where I've just come from, it's a, sort of like an acute crisis. They're expecting their population to shrink by 30%. Um, in the next 20, 30 years. Um, in Africa, by contrast, you have this generation that's now, because of advances in public health, living past childbirth, living past childhood, and sort of suddenly participating in the global economy. And here, I think, you know, blind optimism isn't always, isn't necessarily appropriate. I think uh, a huge population, it's like 650 million people, without meaningful employment without meaningful opportunities, without a stake in some kind of ambition, um, can be really dangerous. Um, there was a joke that we used to tell when I was in Kenya that, you know, A, if you got an A or B, you would go to university. If you got an F, you would just join Al-Shabaab, <laughs> right? Which I think is the sort of crystallizes the real problem you see here. Um, and so I find that the state framework is woefully inadequate to deal with the issue of Africa's demographic dividend. Um, the educational system, which has been a big focus of big projects like the United Nations Millennium Development Goals, has focused on stuff like enrollment, right? Which is like how many butts can you put in yeah. the seats in a classroom? Doesn't mean anyone's learning, doesn't mean anyone's equipped. Well, Land Pritchett has done extraordinary and, and alarming work mm. about the translation between actual enrollment rates and actual human capital uh, right. and sort of what you what people are actually learning while they're sitting in, in those right. seats. Which is very little and I think that shouldn't surprise anyone. <clears throat> a packed classroom doesn't mean that someone is going to be learning. Um, so I think the most interesting innovations specifically dealing with the youth sector have to do with vocational education and have to do with um, continuing education. I think there's this presumption that you know after eighth grade or high school you leave and like you're good. You're all set. Like not to worry. Um, good luck with that. I think for folks who have emerged sort of half-baked or haven't quite gotten the sort of fundamentals down, um, and I was, I was at a school in Somaliland where the girls were taking calculus, but they were also like sort of studying fourth grade long division because like they hadn't quite gotten everything in order. And so there was a need to sort of pay extra attention to making sure everything that was necessary to learn can be learned. Um, so I like private school. Um, and when I say private school, I think a lot of people go, oh, well, that's impossible, it's very expensive. But in Africa, private school is this long-standing tradition of people realizing the state schools are awful, voting with their feet, and spending a little bit of money, you know, we're talking like 2 to $5 a semester, um, to pay um, a religious instructor or sort of, you know, a well-educated couple who will just run a school out of the back of their house. Um, because people really want their kids to do better, like so does everyone. That's the one thing that, you know, when I talk about the bright continent around, the, around the country, people nod their heads. It's like, yes, education. Everyone wants a better future for their kids, including very poor people who are willing to pay for it. So private school is a real alternative. One of the ventures I profile in the book is called Bridge Academies. It's tried to sort of standardize, again, using technology um, and real thinking about what drives outcomes and how to get numeracy and literacy you know, at, a, at a functional level for a young person. Um, they have created this network of private schools. They now are teaching 50,000 kids. They're super ambitious. They want to make it, you know, 10 million kids by 2025. I think they'll be able to do it. 
but I think it's a really important intervention to provide competition within the education space and to provide parents options, which I think, you know, when you talk about American policy debates is something that really scares a lot of folks. Um, but I think in a context, again, where you're driven by necessity to seek better options, um, that becomes a really encouraging alternative. Yeah, it's an interesting way to think about this lean innovation framework because you know basically you're charging tuitions that are competitive enough for people with very low incomes mm -hmm. and yet also it's a situation which parents are deeply concerned about the outcome mm -hmm. and so they're very mindful whereas when you know it's overseas development assistance or something else that's financing um, you know this very rigid set of numerical targets mm -hmm. where we want these people to be in these seats for this amount of time yes. you're not necessarily as attuned to whether or not you know Students right. are actually learning. Right. I mean, I was sort of alarmed and I shouldn't have been surprised, but I still was, to hear how much policymaking is driven by these external metrics, right? I was in Rwanda talking to the um, Betty Mutesi, who's a woman who runs the Millennium Challenge Corporation in Rwanda, which is, you know, this partnership that George Bush, W. Bush, set up to help countries achieve the Millennium Development Goals. And it was kind of like a gold star. Like, if you do these things, you're going to be part of our thing and you're going to get extra money. And so she was like, it was like a large scale form of teaching to the test. She was like, we just got to do what the MDGs say, nothing else, nothing more, like, and, and then we'll get like our, our gold star. And the MDGs were created by people who weren't necessarily very attuned right. to what these students need right. uh, or what the circumstances yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it doesn't mean, MDGs don't mention agriculture at all. I mean, these are drafted in 2000. They don't mention climate change at all, which will affect Africa disproportionately. Um, it has, you know, uh, there's a long discourse sort of debating the MDG's relevance. Um, I obviously, perhaps not obviously, come down against the prescriptive nature of them, particularly given that they're a political agreement, right? They're the least that 192 countries could agree to in 2000. That isn't to say that they're good policy or that it's nimble enough to solve problems as they, as they evolve and emerge. And true to form, you know, they haven't. So over the last 14 years, you've seen a lot of countries race to check the MDG boxes but not necessarily interrogate the underlying presumptions, which were, again, you know, formulated by committee you know, <laughs> more than a decade ago. Well, part of your book is about this idea that many people in the non-African world think of how their choices will shape Africa. Mm -hmm. What should we do for mm -hmm. Africa, et cetera? Um, you're suggesting that this is not the right framework, but how should outsiders think uh, about developments uh, within these African states, this, this new African entrepreneurship, or rather this old African entrepreneurship that's finding new avenues? I think this is one of the most challenging aspects of talking about this topic um, with audiences that are not in Africa. I think for folks um, who are African, who've spent time in Africa, it's kind of like, yeah, definitely, right? It's not a news story. But it is very subversive and surprising to many people who are like, oh, but I thought I was supposed to send my t-shirts. Like, isn't that better than nothing? And the answer is no, it is not better than nothing, right? Um, that if you send a t-shirt, you might put a tailor out of work. You might suppress a textile economy. And, in, and we have seen that sort of Textile manufacturing has shrunk in proportion to the sort of flood of imports. T-shirts never this hurt is, anybody. Yeah, right. I mean, you know, the Denver Broncos T-shirts that are probably making their way to Africa right now, you know, the Super Bowl championships, um, won't do any good. Or, or at least will we'll, we'll not solve the underlying problem, which is not being able to afford clothes, let's say, which requires income, which requires a job, which requires, you know, financing for small businesses. Like, there's a cascading hierarchy of needs least of which is a t-shirt or any other sort of gift in kind. Um, but it's very hard, I think, for people who are sympathetic, who are sort of tuned in, who, are, who have good intentions, to be told that their, intention, their good intentions are just not sufficient. And so I struggle with how to um, sort of talk about this issue. But I do think, for the most part, you know, there are some effective charities. Um, I don't want to name any of them because I don't, I don't feel that's appropriate or that's my role. Um, and, and the norms are changing within the aid economy, right? Well, beyond charities, it also seems as though you're someone who is part of a network of entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who've gone from the non-African world mm -hmm. to Africa to mm -hmm. make money. Mm -hmm. and, and so are you suggesting that that might, in fact, be a better way to quote unquote help? Oh, yeah. I mean, certainly, if I could, the one thing that I didn't know before I started reporting the book and that I know now and will evangelize about until my dying breath is the lack of finance for small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, and this makes me sound like a Republican congressman, so maybe you'll love this. But small businesses are the engine of growth. They are particularly in um, less structured economies where informality is important um, and where large institutions 
tend to be less nimble than you know the the leading sort of iconic companies that we might see in the U.S., which do tend to sort of you know have pretty good operations and and can can change what they're doing. Small businesses really do matter on the ground. Um, these are businesses that are hair salons or professional services or uh, you know small scale manufacturing like like Carpenter and other folks like him. Um, that need to hire five people or 10 people or 50 people and so on and so forth. They can provide a stable income that then supports up to seven other people, right, because of this family dynamic that I mentioned earlier. Um, but these folks are just not getting any money, right? It's a, it's a sector of the economy that's starved of oxygen. Commercial banks are incredibly stingy. They don't take risks. Um, why should they? Interest rates are incredibly high. They'd rather chase real estate deals or infrastructure or, you know, enormous sort of, you know, multi-million dollar, tens of million dollar deals. Um, and, and so they ignore this small, and that's small business class. And what many people have heard of is microfinance. They're like, yeah, entrepreneurs, Africa, we're going to go to Kiva, or sorry, I shouldn't have said any particular, any particular organization. But um, microfinance, people will be surprised to know the average microfinance loan across sub-Saharan Africa is just $500. Now, what would you do with $500 to grow a business? The answer might be not very much. And so I think microfinance, while incredibly important as a sort of stepping stone for people to develop some financial literacy, which for the most part is already existing because people, you know, uh, people have a lot of financial risk and people have a lot of financial transactions they need to navigate every day. Um, but it's just not big enough to do the work that I was talking about earlier of hiring people providing stability and the ability it's to It's the plan. difference between self-employment and entrepreneurship. I mean, to right. build a business enterprise that can scale, that can employ people, right. that can grow. Right. And so there, I think, um, there is a critical need for access to finance and for more intelligent lending, as well as, I would say, technical assistance. So say you are um, an entrepreneur, let's use the example of Nairobi, and you run a parking garage, right? You employ your two nieces and some other guy, and so there's just four of you, and you know, you've got a pretty good business, but it's not like you have a business plan for growth, for buying new land, for you know, investing in hiring more people, for expanding, um, for innovating technologically. Um, and so to be legible to a bank, to really come with a business plan and a plan for growth might be beyond many entrepreneurs in Africa, despite the fact that they're tenacious, that they're doing well, that they're providing for themselves. That growth piece, you know, I've come to believe is essential for um, Africa's growth trajectory. Um, and while it's hard to figure out how you know, a housewife who's interested in making sure kids don't go hungry fits into that equation, I still believe really strongly that that is the sort of critical bottleneck that needs to be solved for Africa to really achieve its potential. So one of your concerns is this idea of development as, as linear, the idea that we're all trying to get to Las mm -hmm. Vegas, to, mm -hmm. to this one end state. Um, as someone who is both American and Nigerian, uh, what would you say is a lesson that you'd want Americans in particular to take away from this new growth trajectory, this new growth story in Africa? Oh, well, I mean, on some level, my answer is political. Um, I think too many times there's a sort of reflexive assumption that a lot of sort of really positive goods, public goods, we could call them, must be provided at the behest of some third party, the state, let's say. And I think across Africa, whether the good is energy, whether the good is road tar, whether the good is health services, the presumption that you could rely on the state for that is sort of laughable. And so there is an extremely robust sort of private sector influence in terms of providing people the things that they need to get by. And I think with that comes and I think in the U.S., by contrast, where those things, maybe there's, uh, there's obviously lots of amazing things that the American private sector does um, to provide um, less than basic goods, right? Um, Consumption-based sorts of things that people, people want, not things that they need. At the same time, there is, I would say, while the American democracy is really remarkable, its dysfunction is never lost on me, you know, as someone who used to cover Washington professionally. Um, and so... Maybe we are blinded here in the United States to alternative ways of thinking about solving problems. Um, they need not necessarily be sort of commercial, right, which is maybe what we talk about when we talk about the private sector traditionally. But as I mentioned, you know, in Africa, there is a sort of communitarianism that also drives a lot of these positive outcomes. You know, why are entrepreneurs social entrepreneurs? Because all entrepreneurship is social because all entrepreneurship ends up helping someone. Um, and, and in that sense, impact investing is all investing in Africa. And so 
you know, communities in America where we're sort of bowling alone, where we're not that invested in sort of the communities in which we live and the sort of public goods that we share, um, that spirit, I think, is something that really could sort of marry what looks like increasing political dysfunction at the center to sort of think more about less concentrated, less hierarchical forms of sort of local engagement. Um, and in that sense, it's a sort of new, or at least expansion of our definition of the private sector um, that I think I feel comfortable um, as a good liberal espousing um, you know, for the United States. Thank you very much, Daya. Yes, thank you.